Um, just waiting for everybody to kind of settle in. We'll give you a few minutes to just to get settled here and as we wait for everybody to log in. So uh, my name is Andrew Hall. I head up marketing here at Dragon Innovation. We have um, Dr. Hassan Rashidi and Dragon CEO Scott Miller. So we will get started in just a few minutes here. So Scott, you have the freezing rain as well. <laughs> no, we do. I was so psyched. I woke up this morning. I saw the snow. I was getting ready to go mountain biking on the fat bike. And then it's like, oh, man, it rained. It's all slush. Yeah. I'm hoping it's going to freeze up tonight and just be a sheet of ice, which is perfect for tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'd take ice over slush any day. Yeah, I think it's supposed to get really cold over the next couple of days. So you might just be in luck there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the new technology on these fat bikes is incredible. You can, you know, just run tubeless tires down to like three or four PSI. And they have just such a big contact patch that they can stick to some, stick like glue, you know, to some pretty gnarly stuff. Yeah, that's, that's wild because, I mean, naturally you'd think ice would be slippery. <laughs> yeah, no, the problem is if you come off the bike and put your foot down, if you dab, you're, it's a whole world of pain because I don't have pads on my, on my shoes. Um, so that's where you get hurt. That's where you take a digger. Yep. Oh, we've got nine, negative nine degrees Celsius in Toronto tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> I guess uh, we're we're okay up here. And Has yeah. Hassan, uh, Hassan, you're you're down in Georgia. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Atlanta. Actually, the weather here it's pretty good. I like I like it. Yeah. Not so cold. Not not warm. It's great. Dang, I think we all have to take a trip down to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> all righty. Well, uh, we'll let the other few folks get settled in as we start up here. But uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody to our live Q&A. So we're talking about design for manufacturing today. So like I said before, I have uh, Dragon Innovations CEO, Scott Miller, and then Dr. Hassan Rashidi. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, thanks for, for joining us. Oh, thanks for having us. This is going to be a blast. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, so I just want to start off just by giving brief introductions. So uh, Hassan, if you wouldn't mind going first, just to give a, a brief intro of who you are, and then uh, we can go from there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I'm Dr. Hassan Rashidi. Uh, I'm an engineer, and I provide seminars, keynotes, lectures, and insights on engineering and technology product development, and manufacturing. Um, I was a postdoctoral fellow in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, I earned my PhD in mechanical and control engineering from Tokyo Tech. And if you want to know more about me, please go to drrashidi.com. Fantastic. All right, Scott, would you mind uh, just giving a quick brief intro? Sure. So I'm Scott Miller, CEO of Dragon Innovation and also an ME, uh, which is, it's uh, fun to be, uh, have a mechanical uh, panel here. Met uh, Hassan down at Georgia Tech, I think uh, this fall, and uh, really had some great conversations around DFM and DFA. So I'm excited to be able to join him on a panel and, and dive into that. Excellent. Well, welcome to both of you. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions submitted um, prior to, to starting this, so uh, I won't take up too much time so we can dive right in. Um, so I just wanted to give you, um, Andrew Hall, I head up marketing here at Dragon and, uh, you know, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't give a quick overview of, uh, of Dragon, what we do. So, so we are Dragon Innovation. We're a manufacturing partner for, for companies that are looking to build complex products and need help with the MPI process or ongoing production. Um, so we can help you whether you're in the early phases of, of the process uh, with our content or early type engagements where you can book one-on-one -on -one manufacturing strategy sessions with uh, our team. Um, and then all the way up through, you know, uh, once you have a working prototype, 
helping you get from that one from one to many. So basically into high volume manufacturing. Um, we do that through our network of manufacturing partners. So connecting you with the right partner uh, at the right time in the right location to help you get uh, your product um, executed at the right cost, quality, and schedule that you're trying to to get your product to your customers. So that is something about us. Um, and then I like to start these uh, Q and A sessions off with a quick poll to, just to see who we have in the audience as well, just so we can get a little bit, get to know a little bit about you all. So I will launch the first poll here. And so this is just a basic question um, to see who's actively working on a product. So we'll let this run for a second here. Cool. It looks like we have just about a 50-50 split. Uh, people are here for here for the here for the education, but also people who are here working on a product. And then let's see. We can launch poll number two. So we just want to know, uh, you know, what your role is at your company. This is always fascinating to me. Alrighty, so looks like we have about 40% engineers and then a mix of operations, product owners, founders. So good stuff. So got a pretty wide range of people in the audience here. So um, you know what? Why don't we just start diving right in here? So uh, again, we have uh, basically fielded a ton of questions prior to this. So um, the basic uh, summary of the topic that we're going to cover is design for manufacturing. So um, again, the, the way that this is kind of structured is I'll read the question um, and then either Hassan or Scott can, you know, jump in to answer that. And then, you know, if, if one of the other just wants to, you know, piggyback off of that to, to help facilitate the conversation, we'll, we'll continue like that. So does that sound good to you all? Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So, Let's dive right in. All right, question one. So is there a good resource textbook that you recommend to teach DFM guidelines for different pr processes to, undergrad to undergraduate engineering students? I'll go to you, Hassan, first. Oh yeah, sure. So, um, well, product development is a very interesting area. And of course there are several good uh, high quality books that can be used. So one is product design for manufacturing and assembly by Boothroyd and Dewhurst. And then we have design for manufacturability. That's another book by um, David Anderson. Then plastic parts, uh, plastic part design for injection molding by Robert Molly. And then designing plastic parts for, in, for assembly by Paul Terrace. And also design for manufacturability hands, handbook by James um, uh, Brella. I think these are good resources, but I'm sure there are other resources that maybe uh, people can look at that. And maybe Scott has more resources that is, that is more relevant to to the production in, in other countries or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's an awesome, awesome list. Um, I really like the Boothroyd Dewhurst book. They provide some good frameworks for how to think about measuring design for assembly, which is nice just to put a little math behind it um, to understand the design maturity. The, on Dragon, we have a whole design for manufacturing assembly course as well. Um, which covers everything from how do you design a plastic part for injection molding or stamping or rotor molding to how do you understand the cost of goods sold or put together a quality plan. Um, so if you have a chance, check, check those out as well. But that's a, an awesome um, set of resources. 
Excellent. Uh, so those are great kickoff questions that kind of get you in the, in the sense of DFM and, and where you can go for some initial high level um, information and education. So um, we'll start to dive a little, a little bit more in depth into, you know, execution on, on it if you, if you do have a product. So um, let's start there. So Hassan, I got another one for you. Um, what are the most common design issues or considerations when moving from hundreds of units, so custom manufacturing, to tens of thousands of units, contract manufacturing? Oh, yeah. So, well, uh, production value has a big role in manufacturing technology selection and material selection. So when you move from uh, hundreds of units to uh, tens of thousands of units, uh, you may also move from, from one manufacturing technology to another manufacturing technology. Also, your material selection may change. For example, if uh, for, for small volume production, you use uh, machining for, for, for producing parts, when you go to higher volume production or mass production, you may consider uh, injection molding or other processes. And then when you change the uh, manufacturing technology and the manufacturing processes, also the material, uh, like I said, selection will change. So again, um, for example, if you use metals for, for housing and uh, enclosures when, when machining parts, now when you move to injection pool, injection molding, you may consider uh, ABS or other plastic materials that is more used in injection molding. So another aspect is when you move from one technology to another technology, in this case from machining to injection molding, molding now you need to design your part for injection molding. Uh, because the way you design the part, you should also always consider. When we do DFMA, you need to consider your materials and your manufacturing technology. One more thing that I should note here is when you move from uh, um, small production to higher volume production or mass production, you also may move from, from uh, manual assembly to semi-automatic assembly or uh, automatic assembly. So when you do DFMA, uh, now you need to do DFMA based on design for manufacturability and assembly, uh, sorry, based on, based on the volume of your production. So with that, there are a lot of factors that you need to consider. So, but uh, these, are, these are the top things that you, you need to implement in your uh, DFMA. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. As you get into the higher volumes, things become um, they move further away from you. So if you're just building 10 of them, you can do it yourself on your dining room table and you don't, don't need to explain to anybody how to put it together. But as you build higher volumes, then you have to start thinking about making tools, which is its own project and picking a partner to help build and then training that partner. So it just does add layers of complexity um, as you start jumping up into the volume. And then of course, everything's amplified. So, you know, at a million units, every penny is $10,000. Um, so it all makes a difference. Whereas you, you're building 10 units, you know, a, a penny is 10 cents. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, so that sounds great. Um, and I kind of want to piggyback off of that, Scott, uh, for this question. So um, how does uh, DFM and supplier selection work together and what kind of uh, what level of completion should be done prior to kicking off uh, with choosing either a factory or, or a manufacturing partner in that regard? Sure. So as we always say, the most important thing you're going to do is to pick a great um, supplier, a great contract manufacturer, and it's worth going through a very rigorous process. But uh, there's a whole spectrum. So some factories are typically um, going to be more cost effective and just build to print. So they really rely on you on having done um, a very thorough job in terms of design for assembly and design for manufacture. So as Hassan was saying, you know, if you're doing injection molded parts, 
you'd have to figure out, you know, what's the draft angle, where's the parting plane, um, maybe even, you know, where do the where do the gates go? Um, and then you can pick a factory that, you know, will just build what you told them to build. And if it works, that's great. But if it doesn't work, it's kind of your fault. The other option, which um, at Dragon, we tend to work with a little bit more, is a factory that has some um, R&D capability so that you only really need to bring your product to what we call the 80% point. So you don't need to think about necessarily drafts and rounds if you're making a molded part, but you can work closely with the factory's team and leverage their knowledge on design for manufacture and assembly. And by doing that, you also really get their um, sort of emotional buy-in that they understand the project and it becomes more robust and, and they become proud of it as well, instead of just building somebody's, you know, somebody's print. But of course, the downside to that is the margins are typically um, higher. So it's a, you know, more expensive um, uh, to work with them. Although if you look at the overall cost of launching a product, it may actually be better to spend a little more money up front to have a smoother um, outcome because all the changes that are made downstream can be quite expensive. You know, obviously it's easy to change a CAD file. It's much more difficult to change a steel tool. Mm -hmm. um, Hassan, I'm going to piggyback off of that with this next question. So, um, you know, as you start to talk about expanding into different, you know, markets or choosing uh, factory partners, um, so some people, they're finishing up their final prototype in the next month or so. Uh, so what else is needed for the DFM process besides CAD files and BOM or bill of materials? Yeah, uh, when, you, when you do, of course, DFM, you really need to, to look at several uh, contract manufacturers. So uh, because it's better really to, to work with the contract manufacturer that you pick uh, and finalize your, your DFM or DFMA because you have to look at their capabilities, their machinery, their experience and expertise, and maybe they have some good recommendations for you. But it's, it's very important to look at different CMs. So you evaluate them. Definitely, it's better to visit their manufacturing facilities and see in, in really see it in, in advance their, their, their manufacturing capabilities. And once you finalize it, it's better to actually uh, work together to develop and finalize the DFMA. Excellent. Um, Scott, I'm gonna kind of piggyback off that as well. So um, how can I find a DFM or DFA expert that can evaluate and design and identifies cost improvements? Right. So, yeah, I think in addition to the Dragon resources, which we have online and trying to leverage the, um, the factory, the more, um, what, well, what we like to do is one, talk to experts, and then two, if you can buy a product that maybe has some similarity and look at it, um, that might give you inspiration on how they tackled some of the different tasks, whether, you know, if we think of design for assembly or DFA, that's basically how do you reduce part count and how do you attach the different components? So um, it's always easier to copy than reinvent. Um, so looking at what's out there is a, um, a good additional way. We love to do teardowns. We've got a bunch that we've done um, in the past, whether it's a toaster oven or a um, mass airflow sensor from a car or a saber saw. And I have to say, every time I do some, one of those, I learn something that I didn't know before. So there's the textbooks, there's the experts, and then just going to Home Depot and buying, buying something and, and sort of learning yourself are methods that we found to be pretty effective. Excellent. Uh, Hassan, anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think like, like Scott said, it's really important to, to learn from experience. So you have to start and you have to, you have to look at different things and because you can, you can look at different uh, resources and uh, different books and you learn a lot, but it, it's very important for you to experience it yourself. And it, it's very important to, to see what, what's working for you because you know, companies are different, products are different. It depends on the, the, the nature of your product and actually you, how you apply the manufacturing triangle, including cost, quality, and um, schedule to your product. Excellent, excellent. 
Um, so I think keeping on track with uh, talking about our, our, our manufacturing partners, um, Hassan, what would you say are the top five criteria to select the right partner for your organization? Well, I think first one thing that I really want to emphasize is they should care about people and customers. So that is really, really important. Um, another thing in order to increase efficiency and effectiveness of, of the process, you really need to have access to their top decision makers. That is really important because things may happen and uh, maybe sometime you need to make a quick decision on something and it's better to have access to those top decision makers. Another thing is um, they should have a good supply chain and logistics in place. Of course, they should have uh, uh, manufacturing ca capabilities that is uh, needed to develop the product like your product. And if they have some previous experience to developing similar products, so that will help. And of course, it is very important for them, in addition to experience and expertise, if they have in-house experts to fix things quickly, because when you don't have in-house experts, things become delayed and uh, things become more, more expensive. And one more thing that I think is important, they should have some success stories. Excellent. Scott, anything else to add on that? Yeah, I guess I'd throw in two things. Um, one is it's just so important to go and visit the factory yourself. Uh, which is why it's often easier to build locally if you can. You know, any factory you can drive to that's capable is is a lot um, easier to work with than one you have to get on a plane. Um, mm -hmm. By doing that, even if you don't have a you know deep experience in manufacturing, I think by relying on your spider sense and what you see, you'll get a feel for it's. It opens up a whole new um, uh, bandwidth for seeing if it's a good fit or not. So I always um, really urge people to go visit the factory and meet with the team. Um, and that will help you go through the five points that Hassan mentioned. The other one I'd throw in there is what we think of as the fish in the pond. So you don't wanna be a small customer typically in a giant factory. So if you're building a hundred units, Foxconn's probably not the right partner for you. Um, but also you don't wanna be a huge fish in a small pond because you won't have the access to working capital or equipment or, or teams that you might um, need to be able to scale. We, um, and it varies, of course, there's exceptions on, on both sides, but, um, you know, generally, you know, if we had to put a number to it, again, depending on the size of your company, if you could be like 5% of a, of a um, tier um, three factory, that's great, five or 10%. If you get to be 95% of their revenue, then that becomes a challenge. And if you're a rounding error, again, you're, you're just not gonna meaningfully move the revenue needle for them. Um, so finding that right impedance match is critical. Yeah, definitely. Um, so kind of uh, continuing on that conversation. So when we're talking about selecting the right ODM or factory, uh, what are the things that go into protecting your IP while working with these ODMs? And, and understanding that cost of hiring. And then if you don't mind, just defining ODM for, for folks. Scott. <laughs> sure, yeah. So original um, design manufacturer uh, and ODM and um, OEM are some, uh, which is original equipment manufacturer um, can be somewhat confusing and overloaded terms. But we think of like an ODM as one that has design capability that you in some cases could go to them with a napkin sketch and they would help be able to translate that into a, into a finished product. When we worked in the toy space, there's many toy factories where you could literally give them a concept sketch and they'd start building product for you, which is pretty cool. They'd have amazing uh, model shops with just uh, incredibly experienced artisan sculptors that cr create 3D models from hand and scan them in. Um, but that's how we think about a, an ODM. In terms of the IP, so we look at it a few different ways. One is that as your relationship progresses with a factory, um, you're gonna get to know them better and, and be able to assess the risk. Um, early on in the request for quote process or RFQ, when you're maybe dating a lot of different factories, we recommend really working on a need to know basis. 
So you need to give them enough information that you can evaluate them and they can evaluate you. But in general, you don't want to share more than you have to. And then after you've picked the factory and you're more comfortable with them, then of course you'll want to disclose more, more information. Uh, but to make it more actionable, you could look at a factory through two lenses. One is organizationally. So in simple terms, a factory has three organizations, three levels. They have the bosses, they've got the engineers, and then they've got the workers. And typically we find the workers aren't going to get access to your IP until you're actually in the, you're shipping. So that would give your competitors, you know, maybe a week or two head start. Um, and any serious competitor can laser scan your model, your product to get the mechanicals or even x-ray the circuit board to get the electronics. Um, so the workers aren't usually the biggest concern. The bosses also are not the biggest concern because typically if a factory lost IP, then every other customer would run away from them um, and the factories would terribly hurt their business. So the ones, and it pains me to say it, but being an engineer, the ones you gotta watch is the engineers because they have access to all of your design files really early on. Um, so again, a need to know basis, work with trusted partners, follow good uh, IP hygiene. So don't leave your computer open, don't leave thumb drives laying around. Ideally have um, just a few people that you know well and are authorized to work on your project and have access to that data and also do it in a secure access controlled room. So that was lens number one. Lens number two is looking at it by system. So as we talked about, mechanical, super easy to copy with a laser scanner. Electrical, totally doable, um, but a little bit more work. The thing we always recommend protecting is your software, which is usually where your most IP is. And in some ways it's the easiest to copy because if you get access to it, there's no effort. But in the other way, if, if you can protect it, it's, um, you know, it, it's where most of the IP and, and often the investment in a company goes into. And the way that we found effective is to use what's called a bootloader. So it's a little, it's a chip with a little bit of reserved memory where you can store secure encryption keys. And then you'd always send the factory encrypted software um, so that, you know, they can't get access to, um, uh, to the native code and then once it's on the chip yeah. it's encrypted and you're you're good to go yeah. so that that's what we would recommend the um there's a bunch of companies that can do it and actually it's funny the one that we worked with um at irobot when we were faced with this which is was avnet um, which is now my my parent company and i was just really impressed 15 years ago and as i am today how well they protected our ip and, and took it seriously um, so there, there's great companies and third parties that can help you out with that. Excellent. Um, Hassan, I got a question for you. Um, so is it more important to have a final closed product in source suppliers or to use suppliers information and adapt your product according to their ideas? Yeah, it really depends on the product. And again, uh, as I said, how you apply the manufacturing triangle to your product that you know uh, how, how important is cost quality and schedule for you but of course one important thing here is your product should meet the design specifications and design specifications are actually based on customer needs and customer wants so at the end you have to deliver a product that you have the end user in mind and within that you may uh, adopt uh, to some, some changes to your design based on the uh, CM that you selected and you finalized. So here, the key is picking the, the right CM for, for manufacturing your product. Because once you have the, the best CM for your product, you can work together based on their capabilities, their machineries, their experience and the technology that they have uh, and work together to develop a DFM or DFMA for your product and together again that's where you can actually deliver a prod the best product possible with the end user in mind. Excellent. Scott anything else to add on to that? No that was that was perfect we really like the collaborative approach 
um, the factories just have so much domain knowledge, having seen hundreds of different customers that uh, we're big fans of trying to tap into that. Excellent. Um, so kind of tapping into that, uh, what, what kind of criteria, Scott, do you use uh, when you're recommending a factory uh, or a manufacturer that's either domestic in the US or instead of going uh, to Asia or, or globally? So we look at a few different things. In fact, I think um, our full list is maybe uh, 20 plus different areas, but to pick a few, one, it's really important that the factory is ethical and capable. Um, so by ethical, I mean that they're gonna protect your IP, they're gonna take care of their workers, they're um, gonna behave as you want a partner to. And then capable means they can you know, build your product. So many times we'd go on tours of factories as we were looking for a new factory for the Roomba and we get a great tour, but the only thing in the showroom was like a stapler and the factory was trying to convince us that a stapler was like the Roomba. Like, yeah, we can build this. So clearly we can build a Roomba. And that was just too big of a gap. So I'd say that type of factory is not, is not capable. Um, one of the things I love to do, um, and I see this as a, a question that came in from Dan in terms of what questions to ask the, um, the factory to find out if they're right fit, is just pick something somewhat esoteric and then see how the factory answers it. And I can give you a, like a simple one, um, which works even if you haven't done manufacturing before. But most consumer electronics have some sort of a circuit board or a, what's called a PCB or PCBA um, in it. And today, most of them are, um, are surface mount. So there is a SMT machine that's going to place all the resistors and capacitors and processors on the board. And then that board typically goes through an oven, which causes the solder to reflow and um, mechanically and electrically attach the components to the board. So the question I love to ask is, you know, tell me how you um, handle your solder paste. And even if you don't know what the right answer is, what you're looking for is A, they have an answer and it's detailed and it makes sense. So the wrong answer would be, well, yeah, I don't know. We, we, we don't really do much with it. The right answer would be walking you over to the freezer where they store the solder paste. Every solder paste has a date code on it. And then there's a written procedure where they let it come up to temperature for six hours. They use it in um, the reflow oven for say up to 24 hours and they throw it away. And again, you don't need to necessarily know all the details, but you want to sort of gauge them by how thoroughly they answer the, the question. And it's fine if the person you ask the question doesn't know the answer, um, but they should be able to go and find the person and she should know the answer um, so that they have that expertise. It also shows you that you're going to be working with the A team, so that that's one of my favorite things to do on do on a visit. But we talked about the um, impedance match or the fish in the pond. Make sure they're the right fit. Um, geographic region is a big deal. Are they nearby? Are they far away? Um, and then you could even peel back that onion into like currency issues or, sadly today, like world health issues um, could um, could play a role. Um, but, uh, but yeah, maybe that's a, a good list to get started with. Excellent. Hassan, I, anything else to add? I want to add this that you need to see how passionate they are about your product because that is really, really important. Do they want to be a part of this? So that, that, that is very important. If they like your product and they, they want to be a part of that and they have enough experience and technology and expertise to do that, I think that is very important because at the end of the day, you have to, ha you have to deliver something that you really love to be a part of it. Excellent. Um, Hassan, I kind of want to take a step back here and, and um, you know, as you continue to develop your product, um, I have a question on, on here. What steps are needed to incorporate DFM, DFMA into the existing design or development process that you're currently in? Yeah, sure. So first, I think it, it's really, it would be great if the design team are familiar with DFMA because it is very important to know the importance of DFMA early on so that whatsoever function or, you know, uh, systems or subsystems that you want to design, you have that in mind that eventually this has to go through DFMA in order to make the, you know, make it efficient and cost effective. So that's the first thing. And then 
other than that, uh, when you look at the DFMA pr process, um, you should you should you should do DFMA together with technology selection and material material selections. So these these three are very important together to be done to be to be considered together. And with that, it's better to finalize your contract manufacturing. So it's better to look for different contract manufacturing, look at their capabilities, talk to several of them, and it's better to finalize your CM early on. And once you have, once, and you do that, of course, after you have your final prototype. When you have your final prototype, you need to look for several CMs, finalize one, and do DFMA with them. So when you finalize your CM now, uh, you really, it's best to work together with them based on their capabilities and again, their manufacturing facilities uh, to develop the DFA together because it's beneficial for both of you and the CM as well. Because sometimes you, you may, based on their experience working on similar products, maybe they have really good, good ideas so that you can incorporate in your, in your design process. So with that, it's, it's really better to know your material selection, your technology selection and the CMs and work with the CM to finalize your, 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 your design. One more thing that is very important, it is better to finalize your design, of course, including DFMA before making any tool. Because once you have the tooling and you have your production line set up, it is very, very difficult to make changes and it will be very expensive. So you don't want to, you don't want to finalize your design and, you know, create tooling and have production line set up. And at the last minute, you want to make changes that will make it very difficult and uh, cost, um, costly for, for, for your product. Excellent. Speaking about cost, uh, Scott, I got a question for you. Um, do you have any tips on effective DFM for the lowest cost offshore manufacturing? Mm, right. So typically at, um, to be able to hit the cost targets there, you probably are going to want to invest a fairly large amount of time or effort into design for assembly and design for manufacture. Um, because again, just remember, based on a million units, every penny translates to ten thousand dollars. So it's it's worth the extra effort to um, to do that. And at that point, um, you're looking for really high um, assembly. We always start with design for assembly, and then move, um, which is at the overall product level, and then move into design for manufacture, which is the at the part level. Um, but you're looking for really cost effective ways to assemble the, the parts. So you're probably counting screws. Um, I know, uh, again, I use the Roomba sometimes for an example. On the first one we built, it had a tremendous amount of hot glue, which is nothing we're proud of. It's not a good thing, but, um, but that was kind of our, our band-aid, our, our duct tape. Um, and we actually used so much hot glue that we used, it cost a lot of money. So we used to weigh the hot glue to understand how much you know, hot glue we are using in each product so that we, you know, made sure we were being charged a, a fair amount. But as you get into higher volume, you really will go down to that level of molecular um, sort of analysis. You'll also look really carefully at labor rates. So um, in labor times, how long does it actually take to put together the product um, versus what is the factory charging you to put it together? Um, you'll think about scrap. So making sure that the product goes together very efficiently and that there's not a lot of defects because those all will erode your, erode your margins. Generally too, when you're getting in those high volumes, which uh, Hassan has mentioned, you think about the manufacturing triangle um, and want to optimize just the cost, not only the cost, but also the quality side. Because obviously if you build a product that has a um, unfavorable return rate, then whatever you saved on cost, you're just going to give up on, um, you know, sending replacements. So you've got to um, make sure that it survives as long as it's intended and basically is fit for purpose. Um, so there's, there's a lot more to cost than just cost. Excellent. Um, Hassan, I think this is a good uh, question for you. Um, 
So how does one quantify DFM and DFA? Yeah, um, there are different ways to quantify DFM and DFMA. Um, one technique that is widely used is both through uh, Dewhurst technique that is based on two things. One, uh, minimizing the number of uh, assembly operations by minimizing the number of parts and two, uh, designing parts uh, for ease of assembly so that the assembly process itself become very straightforward and intuitive. So it deals a lot with designing part geometry so and make it really easy for, for, the, for the person that want, uh, or the system that wants assemble these parts be very straightforward and uh, not wasting time to look at different angles, what orientation the part should go. So you have to minimize uh, a lot of guesses or things like that. So make the assembly uh, very straightforward. Actually, they developed a software for this and I recommend uh, visiting their website, dfma.com. Uh, you will find a lot of good information about quantifying uh, DFMA and how to use their software and their technique to, to do that. Um, another way to do this is to use uh, design efficiency matrices and benchmark. Uh, so what you do here, uh, you measure the efficiency of your design uh, compared to an existing product and benchmark based on several criteria, like I said, uh, the number of um, parts, the number of the operation, uh, assembly operations, and etc. So you just pick a part, pick a, uh, look at the, an existing product and compare your design with that. And you can come up with a good, 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 good evaluation. How you, how you are, how how efficient is your design? Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we're kind of coming up on time here, so I got one final question for Scott. Um, and it's not meant to be a negative question. Uh, I want people to learn from this so that they don't do this. So, Scott, there's so many successful crowdfunding hardware companies and other companies in that in that space. Why do some of them ultimately fail? Yeah, so, and again, we, we love crowdfunding. Um, it's uh, been really an enabler for the hardware movement. But more often than not, what we see is that they don't raise enough money. And there might be a few reasons for that. But um, in the past, um, say, with many of them, you set a threshold. And then if you can get above that threshold, you get all the money. And if you don't get above the threshold, you don't get any money. So there's kind of a natural tendency to set the bar lower. Um, so that you, you know, get the money. But the problem is that many of the companies doing this don't understand the cost of the tools. And without the tools, you can't really build in volume at the right cost targets. So, uh, you know, if your tools cost half a million dollars and you only raise 300,000, it's gonna be really difficult to deliver on your promise. The things to keep in mind as you're setting that threshold are, you know, what is the tooling cost? What is the other non-reoccurring uh, engineering? So that might be things like UL safety compliance or hiring a, a DFA um, firm to assist you or whatever it is, those fixed costs, um, in addition to the fixtures to put together your product. And then for your product, how many do you want to sell? So that's your volume. And what's the cost of goods sold, which is you know, how much do you have to pay the factory for your product? those two you'd multiply together and then add your fixed cost and that will give you a rough idea of what the threshold should be. But more, not, more often than not, companies just guess and that generally uh, ends in tears. Excellent. All right, well, we are coming up on time here. I wanna thank both uh, Dr. Hassan Rashidi and uh, Dragon CEO Scott Miller for their time here. Um, again, thanks to all of you also for, for participating in this and, and submitting such great questions. Um, and we hope we answered as much as we could. Uh, so if you feel like your question didn't get answered or you have more information that you want to seek out, uh, feel free to email us directly at help at dragoninnovation.com. 
Um, or you can tweet at uh, Dr. Hassan Rashidi as well. Uh, he's very active on Twitter. So feel free to give him a follow. Um, so we have a recording of this. Uh, so you can go back and watch at your leisure. Um, so we'll get that out to everybody um, you know, early next week. Um, so once again, thank you, everybody. Thank you to our, our panelists here. Uh, and we will see everybody next time. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, right. Thanks Hassan. Bye, Thanks. guys.